Genesis 48. As we go through our studies here, we are at Jacob's final will and testament. He's going to give the blessings to his sons, but it's going to start off not really a blessing for the first sons. Verse 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Isn't it interesting that you see the mention about tribulation, about end times, in the book of Genesis? So ever since Genesis, the Lord already is uh, setting up stuff for the tribulation events. So this verse is very important to understand. Now, meaning... I'm going to explain each and every word here, as usual. Jacob, he summoned all of his boys together. And he said, I want you to uh, gather yourselves together. I want you to assemble around me so that I can tell you what's going to befall you, what's going to happen to you. That's the meaning of befall. In the last days. So in the tribulation, that's what last days are referring to. Now, the scholars especially those who are not premillennial, those who are amillennial, maybe those who are postmillennial, they do not believe that what Jacob was talking about is literally the last days. They think that the last days, it could refer to some time in the Old Testament, and some could probably put it even more so in the future as far as to Jesus' timeline or first centuries. That's pretty much as far as they would go. But no, we believe that when the Bible says a certain word, it means as it says. So when it says last days, it literally means last days. You don't have to think about, well, the context of that person for last days means the last days of his time or first centuries or in the Old Testament. No, last days is last days. The only time where we'll recognize in a division of the word or the term is when the context contradicts other scriptures. In this case, we don't see that. We see it complementing more. That's what you're going to find out in the context here. It complements more with other scriptures. If it contradicts other scriptures, then we put a division. So that's important to understand. Sometimes you'd be surprised that the False, doctrinal, uh, false doctrine scholars could be more dispensational than you in dividing. It's kind of funny. They don't realize that. When we go to Genesis chapter 49, verse 1, we see that this is referring to the end times. It is important to understand that if last days is referring to the tribulation, then that means it's about prophecy, correct? Since last days is about tribulation, and it will talk about then prophecy. This is very important. Uh, I love getting into uh, biblical hermeneutics, so uh, I'm just going to give only briefly, but that's one of my favorite subjects to teach. What's life-changing to you, you have to understand where dispensationalism comes from is this key word, believe it or not. It's prophecy. Now think about it, all those charismatics, they make a big deal about prophecy. When Tim LaHaye got his books out, people are so much into prophecy. A lot of people, uh, deep down inside their hearts, they are very interested in prophecy. They're interested in what happened will end times, apocalypse. Dispensationalism is born because of prophecy itself. Prophecy forces us to have dispensationalism. If you look at Clarence Larkin's book, the very first pages, I mean, he talks about mountain peaks of prophecy. That's one of his earlier chapters before he gets into more of the heavy stuff in dispensationalism. The reason why we rightly divide things is because when God is speaking about the future, prophecy is not a clean-cut timeline. Now, that's something you got to understand in your head. Prophecy is not, it is not a clean sequence of time. You might say, why is that? Well, I mean, you just have to look at other oracles or other uh, prophets or so-called prophets. Usually when people try to give a prediction or a prophecy about the future, let's forget the Bible here. 
But people who claim themselves to be prophets or talk about the future, when they give some kind of prophecy, it's not a clean-cut timeline. It's abstract or all over, right? That's the point of a divine oracle. It's that mysterious. It's something hidden. It's something that only special people could see. But that's the reason why the Catholic Church takes abuse of that, and they said you can only go through the priest to find out the real meaning of prophecy. Same thing with uh, certain globalists and elites today. The, the reason why some of them get into masonry and some of those evil people like that hidden stuff, the secret uh, societies and club, theosophy, masonry, etc. They said only light can be given to us. Only we get the hidden secrets. See, a lot of people deep down inside, they are into that stuff. Globalists claim that they got it through the devil or through Lucifer. And then the Catholics claim that they get it through their priests. We claim we get it because of the word of God. And every man, woman, and child can get that book in their hands and find the truth for themselves. We get light. If you have the Holy Spirit inside your heart, you're saved. And if you're saved, then the Spirit gives you light through the word of God. So then when God gives a prophecy, see, it's going to be all over. The devil knows that. So that's why he has his own prophets doing that. And that's why the atheistic world or the secular world, they just scoff about prophecy. And they say, well, the prophecies of the Messiah, you can do the same thing with Nostradamus, you can do it with Joseph Smith, you can do it with other people. But the difference with those guys, those guys, they say mumbo jumbo that you can apply to anything. But in the word of God, even though that we admit there is some abstract stuff, there are certain key words that undoubtedly prove the prophecy to be true. See, the key is that we believe the word to be true. We take the word literally. But if you have an Alexandrian cult mentality about the meaning of a word, sure, you can't uh, tell the difference with us and Nost Nostradamus and other prophets. See, that's why being a King James Bible believer is so important, believing every word to be perfect and true. Because that forces you then to look at the context. And the context gives the proper interpretation. That also makes you compare scripture with scripture. That shows you the proper interpretation. Book of Mormon don't do that. Quran don't do that. Nostradamus don't do that. You, they don't have, the key thing is they don't have biblical hermeneutics. See, they don't have a right interpretation set up. They have an open interpretation set up. Just like any English major, you can read a literature book and then have an open interpretation. But the Bible set up very differently. You have to look at context. You have to look at scripture with scripture. Basically, the word of God interprets itself. That's what it means. If you go by context, scripture with scripture, taking the word as it says, that's literally God's word interpreting for his own words. That's important to keep in mind. So prophecy is going to be all over. Larkin wrote in, I don't know if you noticed this, in his cover, he said, uh, I think he called it the greatest book on prophecy or something like that. Because prophecy, so we see no doubt prophecy is integrated with dispensationalism. Yeah. So then when you get into conspiracy theories or when you get into end times or the charismatics make a big deal on prophecy, so then they go to uh, losers like uh, Perry Stone and other speaking in tongues mumbo jumbo guys. And they all, uh, Sid Roth, and they get all into that kind of stuff. The charismatics, if you studied our church history class from intermediate discipleship, you got to realize they wouldn't have become popular as they are now if it weren't for a Baptist heritage, if it weren't for a dispensational heritage. But that's how those cults were able to take over after that. But that's a whole nother story. The point is, though, is that the charismatics, they realize, or people don't realize, that this prophecy that they're so into is integrated with dispensationalism. It's born from dispensationalism itself. Perry Stone wouldn't have a ministry. Tim LaHaye wouldn't sell so many books had it not been for dispensationalism. Come on. See, they have to give a lot of credit to that. That teaching is incredibly eye-opening. It's... They realize they cannot survive without dispensationalism. When you get into conspiracy theories and, you know, tribulation and the Antichrist and all that kind of stuff, you're not getting it from Infowars or Alex Jones and stuff like that. These birds don't realize it that long time ago before they were showing prophecy or Alex Jones was prophesying about the future, 
The Bible was way ahead. Dispensationalism was born a long time ago. And prophecy, people's interest in prophecy was born a long time ago. And they were studying all of that. So people who get into that without dispensationalism will fall into wrong doctrine. They cannot predict properly end times for you. So I don't care how much information you know on InfoWars, you will not predict the future accurately. As a matter of fact, I'll guarantee you this. You ready for this? I promise you, if you get so much into that, you'll be more confused. Because so-and-so has one article and another person has another article. InfoWars believes in like uh, freedom of information, sure, fine and dandy, but, that, but what that, it comes at a price. It comes at a price is what is truth. I mean, they got, Ru they got pro-Russian articles pretty much over there, and then other people who are not into Russia over there. And then it's like, where are you going to find the truth? So then it becomes so confusing. So then you cannot find truth that way. So if you want the truth about end times, you get into the book. And when you get into the book, dispensationalism, whether you like it or not, is the truth. And it will incredibly open your eyes. So remember this. Dispensationalism goes hand in hand with prophecy because it's all over, remember. It's all over the timeline. So what does dispensationalism force us to do? Rightly divide. Putting the verse at the right group of people. The right time period. See that? So when there is a prophecy or a verse that gives a prophecy, and we'll see some examples, you're going to notice that you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to divide half of a verse, put it at uh, a time period in the future, and then the second half of the verse is not going in sequence. You have to go back in time and put it in the past. You're going to see that with one verse. You, you will see that soon later on. We're going to cover that. So because Jacob is prophesying, dispensationalism will have to be enforced. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense. I've seen so many, uh, it's interesting, the commentators, when they deny dispensationalism, the majority of them in Genesis 49 cannot deny that this is referring to a messianic prophecy and that they'll have to rightly divide. And the majority of them also make a mistake where they try to give a portion of, a, uh, of the prophecy to first coming rather than second coming. But you're going to see plainly, there's no doubt, Scripture interprets Scripture, not Gene Kim, not the commentators, not Nostradamus, some abstract interpretation. You will see very soon that the Word of God will plainly show you the interpretation that not even anyone or Nostradamus himself can conjure up his own interpretation. It's impossible. You cannot do that when you do scripture with scripture, when you look at context, when you look at the word of God interpreting itself. Now, I say all this stuff. I know this may seem like filler, but it's not. It's a whole bunch of nuggets that I don't want you to forget because we're going to apply that now uh, with uh, these boys later on. And, you're, and you will see. Yeah, good. When it comes to prophecy, remember this. Prophecy is talking about the future. So if it's talking about the future... It could be at the first coming of Christ. It could be at the second coming of Christ. It could be during their timeline. So we have to realize it. It's just simply predicting about events in the future. And when God talks about things in the future, he can go all over the place. I mean, anybody has the right. If I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the future, uh, the next 10 years, I, don't, uh, I can just say a whole bunch of stuff. A whole bunch of senses, what's going to happen to this individual, that individual, this individual in the room. But I may not do it in a clean-cut timeline. See, uh, everybody's timeline here, when I predict your future, could be different orders. Now, if that's common when people talk about uh, the future of a group of people or a nation, then more so with the Word of God, you're going to have to divide it and put it in the right timeline. Now, I hope this made a lot of sense to you, okay? Now, let's uh, cover uh, two verses where it shows this is referring to end times. It says last days, right? So we're going to look at the book of James, chapter 5. Look at the book of James, chapter 5. A lot of people try to apply this epistle to uh, the church age, but no, that is not true. You're going to find out right here that this is referring to a tribulation context. 
you're going to notice that it is undoubtedly referring to a tribulation context. All right, we're going to look at the book of James, chapter 5. Notice that the Word of God points out at verse 3, James chapter 5, and verse 3, Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped, together, uh, ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now, James is talking about rich people where they gather their silver and their gold, but it's going to eat them up as if it were fire. And this is reserved for what? It says last days. It's going to be in the future. Now, continue reading on. If you look at verse 7, verse 7, notice, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the what? Coming of the Lord. Uh, look at the last part of verse 7 till he received the early and what? Louder rain. So that's referring to last days. It's future. So it's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. Look, uh, well, obviously Jesus already came at the book of James. So that's his first coming. So James is not talking about that. He's talking about his second coming. So when it's talking about last days, it's referring to the second coming of Christ. If you also look at verse 8, verse 8, Notice right here, the last part of verse 8, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. See that? Now, if you go to Malachi, go to the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Book of Malachi, chapter 4. Notice that the coming of Christ comes down and burns up the enemies as if it were fire. The coming of Jesus Christ comes down with fire and burns up the enemies. Why do you think James 5, he said that you wicked people will be burned up by fire when Jesus Christ comes down? In the last days, he says as well. So look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, notice right here, the day cometh. Ah, then the author is saying this is something a specific, something everybody's been waiting for. Somebody, uh, someday that everybody's expecting. That shall burn as an oven, fire, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up. See, the day that comes where they will be burned up. Why? The coming of Jesus Christ at verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Notice Jesus Christ is coming down. Okay, so the last days is referring to Jesus' second coming. When we go to Genesis 49. All right, go to Genesis 49 again. So the last days is referring to Jesus' second coming. No doubt tribulation. So it proves true again. It's a tribulation context. It's, it can't be referring to the Old Testament. It can't be referring to the first centuries. Otherwise, what are you going to do with James 5? What's he talking about? The coming of the Lord draw up nigh. Jesus already come that time. So it doesn't make sense. Okay, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 49. And then we'll read verse 2. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Okay, self-explanatory, but I'll explain every word. So Jacob tells his boys to gather themselves together around him and to hear what he has to say. And he addresses them as the sons of Jacob's. Ye is a plural term for you all. And he tells them to listen unto your father Israel. All right, here we go. Verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. So Jacob says to Reuben, hey, you are my firstborn son. So the firstborn son is usually, when you look at throughout the Bible, is someone that is praised, is the best representative of the family, the strongest pillar in the family. So he addresses him with all those descriptions by calling him my might. So he is his ability, his strength. The beginning of my strength. So uh, his strength begins through his firstborn Reuben. He addresses him that way. He describes him also as uh, very uh, excellent dignity. Excellent dignity. Uh, 
excellent power as well. Excellent power as well. However, the so-called excellence in dignity is not, uh, is not really that uh, is not really that praise, is not really that good. So that's why Jacob, he starts it out that way. The firstborn should be that way. So a lot of high expectations on that. If you ruin that, you ruin everything in our family tree. So notice that the uh, oldest sons had it very easy during the Old Testament time, all right? It's not like the American family, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's strange, though. Somehow, unconsciously, in the family, the oldest uh, sibling always have that kind of uh, thing in their minds that they have a responsibility as being the oldest child, taking care of the siblings, and etc. So it's kind of a strange thing. So uh, deep down inside everybody's uh, fleshly instinct, we know that the firstborn is someone like that has that much accountability. We know Reuben messed up, right, in the previous chapters. So, such a high calling, high responsibility, high accountability, he's going to get hit really hard then. The punishment will also be very high. So look at verse 4. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. Basically, what Jacob said is that uh, he is not stable because he's like water, you know, up and down. He's not firm like a rock. Because of this, Jacob says, you're not going to excel. You're not going to improve. You're not going to be blessed because you went up to your father's bed. You corrupted it uh, because of, uh, you know, what Reuben did uh, with uh, Jacob's uh, uh, handmaiden, handmaiden at that time. So Reuben defiled it, he corrupted it, he went up to my couch. That's the same idea of corrupting the bed. It's kind of, <laughs> this is one thing you kind of hate about uh, people when they're going to give you their last will and testament or a pastor who's about to say, uh, summon you and say, hey, come over here, I got something to say to you. And then you start out, you know, you're a blessing. You're my might. You're my strength. You represent, you're the representative of our church. But you always hate that, right? You usually you have that in your mind, you know, when people, <laughs> it's kind of funny. When your parent talks to you that way, pastor talks to you that way, or somebody else talks to you that way. Uh, being a pastor, hanging around with other pastors, I, I can predict that too. They just start out with something nice and you're like, oh, <laughs> it's going to lead to something. <laughs> Now, with my parents, uh, your parents might be that way, but my parents, it's not like that. You know, I know when I get in trouble, all right? They'll just tell you right out flat, you know? They're not going to go, son, you're my eldest. You're my firstborn. No, my dad will say, hey, get over here. Then I already know what that means, okay? <laughs> it's just that simple, you know? <laughs> all right. In verse 4, we have to see that Reuben, he did... Uh, unfortunately did not get the blessing, but he did get the curse. Now, I'm going to be reading mainly uh, from Dr. Ruckman's uh, commentary book because he's got a lot of verses on this, and he's got a lot of good nuggets, so it would, uh, to give him better credit, I don't think it would do him justice, basically, if I just explained to you. It would be better if I read to you a lot of the stuff that he's given out. So he mentions uh, from Genesis chapter 49 concerning about Reuben that he did receive a decrease in population. And we're going to look at Numbers chapter 1 concerning that. Go to Numbers chapter 1. So notice that he did not excel. He did not excel. Go to Numbers chapter 1. And then we'll look at verse 21, and then your hand to get ready at Numbers 26. We're going to immediately go there, Numbers 26. All right, Numbers chapter 1, verse 21. Those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Reuben, were 40 and 6,500. Okay, but look at chapter 26, verse 7. Chapter 26, verse 7. Oh. The Bible points out, these are the families of the Reubenites, and they that were number of them were forty and three thousand and seven hundred and thirty. So you'll notice right here that definitely that there was a gap. Uh, there was a gap right here. There's a change. 
So notice a decrease in population at Numbers 1 and Numbers 26. So Reuben, he did not excel. As a matter of fact, when we look at uh, Numbers chapter 16, Numbers 16, and 2 Kings 10, Numbers 16, and 2 Kings 10, Dr. Rockman points out that the land that Reuben is supposed to inherit from Israel actually did not turn out to be that way. So he didn't really get the inheritance that he should get. And as a matter of fact, later on, he does get, uh, so to speak, disinherited. We're going to look at these two cases right here. First of all, go to Numbers chapter 16, and then we'll look at verse 1. Numbers chapter 16, and then we'll look at verses 1. Uh, through 25. Now, uh, when you look at, I'm not going to read everything right here, but uh, when you look at Numbers chapter 16, verse 1 through 25, we get a case about uh, Dathan and then Abiram and then Korah. It turns out to be a calamity. The sons of Reuben here, they try to excel. You're going to notice at verse 1, notice it says, And Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Now, you know what happens when you read verse 1 through 25. God wipes them out. So notice that Reuben's family tree is not really that good. It starts to get cut off. In 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 33, 2 Kings chapter 10, and then we'll look at verse 33. Dr. Rutman mentions that he gets, so to speak, disinherited in the end. Second Kings chapter 10, verse 33. From Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites, from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, even Gilead, and Bashan. Notice verse 32, context. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short. And Hazael smote them in all the coasts of Israel. And it concentrated on what? Reubenites. Reubenites. As a matter of fact, you're going to also find out, uh, I think it was in the book of Numbers, where they were going inside the land of Israel, but Reuben decides uh, with the other tribes, I think it was Gad and half of Manasseh, but they, want, they didn't want to really inherit the promised land. Yeah. Israel because they want to raise cattle. They were very worldly-minded, see. They were very worldly-minded. They weren't thinking about the promised land that God has given. They were looking at more of the now and now land that they saw in the world. Now that's, Reuben pictures very much as us, see. Very worldly and very fleshly. Because instead of the, looking at the promised land, things that are better that God wants to give to us, we're looking at the now and now land. The now and now things, what we want. And because of that, we choose the world and we say, hey, I'd rather choose this world rather than the promised land. Can you imagine that? But that's what a lot of you are saying. A lot of you may not say that. A lot of you may not think that. But your flesh is doing that. As soon as your flesh chooses sin, as soon as your flesh chooses these worldly opportunities, more than serving God, more than church, more than getting involved in ministry, you already made a decision that the world I choose the world, I want the world, the world is better than the promised land. So you have to keep that in your mind. Reuben greatly pictures about uh, the flesh. He greatly pictures the flesh. Look at Judges 5. Judges chapter 5. Worldly minded and fleshly minded. We see the worldly minded part where he wants uh, the land. He wants the cattle, not the promised land. We've seen the fleshliness where he went up to his father's couch. That's why it makes a lot of sense why Jacob could not trust Reuben. Do you see that? Even though Reuben said, I'll sacrifice two of my boys, Jacob's like, no, I know you. You're one year out the other. So one thing you notice, now probably some parents with prodigal children might understand this. Usually people who are so much into the world and flesh are very unstable. 
Now, I don't know if there are some parents who can know what I'm talking about right here, but when you got kids who are so much into the flesh, so much into the world, you always wonder, you know, why their mood's like this, and you can't reason with them, and they're just so in unstable. So much instability in their lives. Look at the liberals. They greatly picture that because uh, unlike conservatives, now conservatives have their problem, obviously, but the key difference with conservatives and liberals is one side uh, emphasizes more on morals, see? The other side doesn't because liberals are basically thinking what makes you feel good is what's wrong with that. But what's wrong with that is when you look at the liberals living, they're always like this. It's not stable. That's why they're not able to make successes in life because they don't have a strong foundation. They always are unstable. One day they're doing this and then the other day they do that. I want to become this when I grow up and it doesn't pan out. And I want to become that when I grow up. Uh, liberals, they're, uh, they're too positive. Uh, they need to be negative minded. They think that the world is such a wonderful, beautiful place that options are unlimited. They, they can just choose whatever they want to do in life <laughs> without realizing there's a negative cost to that. And that's why they have an alphabet soup, if you know what I mean by that, right? So because of that alphabet suit and colors of the rainbow, that's why they keep changing whatever they want to be. And then it gives us so much depression, so much unhappiness, you wonder why they always go to therapy. Yeah. Why? Because they keep changing their mind. They're, not, they're very in, uh, unstable. Yeah. So that should be incredibly eye-opening to you. Now, if you have some instability in your life, you have to look at these two parts. You know what I mean? So if, you're, uh, if you feel like that your life has no meaning, that uh, you're up and down and you're not stable, you have to look at this. You have to look at this. And then if you think that you're not stable, but you're living life into the world in the flesh, you better, watch, you better keep your eye on this. You better keep your eye on this. Some people who are so much into this and they think that they got it made and they're all set, uh, they don't look at certain patterns and signs where they've been unstable. And that pride blinds them, and they will die in their pride. Judges chapter 5, and then we'll look at verse 15. Judges chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 15. The Bible says, And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was, set on, he was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart, why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. What does that mean? So what's going on is at the time of the book of Judges, uh, uh, they were going out to war. But then when they were going out to war with Deborah and Barak, the Reubenites, they weren't as stable to go out to war. They were unstable. So they had to search the hearts. They had to see what's going on. They had to do some soul searching. Why? Because, verse 16, they were so much into their cattle, into their flocks. See, their now and now. Their worldly mindedness is on that. All right. Now we continue on in Genesis chapter 49 and then verse 5. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 5. Simeon and Levi, our brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitations. Jacob, he uh, starts out with Simeon and Levi, that they're brothers. But then he says that uh, they got instruments or weapons or devices that are very cruel in their abode, in their uh, dwelling places, in their home. Why is their home filled with devices of hatred, of cruelty? Because there's violence in there. So basically, he's saying there's violence in the home. Verse 6, O my soul, come not thou uh, into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Okay, the meanings are as follow. There are several figures of speech here. So he mentions at verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. And Jacob, he says... Uh, he cries out to his own soul, Oh, my soul, don't go to their secret. Don't find it out. Uh, don't go to their assembly, their group, their people. Because 
he, has, he doesn't want anything to do with it due to the violence in the home at verse 5. So he says, don't go to their home, have nothing to do with them. He also says, Jacob also says, my honor will not go along with them. So in other words, uh, Simeon and Levi, they brought dishonor to their family, if, if that's the Asian term for it. He says, my honor will not go to them. It's not going to unite with them. It's not going to follow along with them. It's going to be separated from them. So he wants to be separated from their cruelty as much as possible. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will uh, they dig down a wall. Jacob says that because of their anger, they killed a man. And we know what that is. That is referring to Shechem and Hamor. So we won't go back over there. In their self-will, so it's their own will, their selfish will. That's important to understand. It's their selfish will that they, what, dig down a wall. Now, what does dig down a wall mean? Usually, uh, even nowadays, we, <laughs> uh, people are referring that to politics and building up a wall, right? And then other people saying tearing down the wall. But you, uh, what's the meaning of that? The wall is for security. It's to show the dividing line, this is our home. So there shouldn't be trespassing, invasion, or illegal immigration, or etc. You know what I mean? So that's why uh, even today's politics, those terms are quite often used about the wall, because it's referring to, this is my property, this is my home. So then when somebody comes in, like Simeon and Levi, they kill these people. Usually, why we want to keep out trespassers is because of safety, right? Yep. Safety. So if somebody trespassed into your home, you're going to expect violence, correct? So that's why uh, you get scared. Simeon and Levi, by trespassing the property, they did bring violence to Shechem and Hamor. So that's the idea, that's the meaning behind they dig down a wall. So then... Uh, they were digging, and then they just broke the wall apart. That's the idea. So it's a figure of speech, meaning that they just shoveled down the wall all the way to the ground. And then there's no wall left, and then they're able to invade, go through. Verse 7, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So Jacob says that their anger is such a curse. It's a... They're going to be cursed for it because it was horrible. It was fierce. And their anger, which is another word for their wrath, it was very cruel. So Jacob says that Simeon and Levi's uh, people, they're going to be divided in Israel. And they're going to be scattered throughout the land of Israel. And we've seen uh, these predictions coming true uh, with Simeon and Levi. Uh, Dr. Uckman, he mentions again, when we look at uh, his commentary here about Simeon and Levi, it is referring to, let's see here, he gives up uh, several verses where it points out what happened to them. Numbers chapter 26. Numbers chapter 26. He becomes the smallest of the 12 tribes, actually, when you look at Simeon. Look at Numbers chapter 26, verse 14. Dr. Upman mentions that Simeon becomes the smallest of the 12 tribes. The Bible says these are the families of the Simeonites, 20 and 2,000 and 200. But then Dr. Upman mentions when you compare it with all the other families, he becomes the smallest. So he does get caught down deeply. Also, uh, when you look at uh, Joshua chapter 19, Joshua chapter 19, Dr. Uckman further mentions that Simeon was never given a true inheritance. So Joshua is where he's dividing the land. Look at Joshua chapter 19, and then we'll look at verses 1 through 9, Joshua chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Dr. Uckman mentions that uh, the tribe was only given a portion that was near Judah and only a few cities within his uh, territory. Joshua chapter 19. 
Verse 1, And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families, and their inheritance was what? Within the inheritance of what? The children of Judah. Because Judah is so blessed, you're going to find out. So then, Simeon can only take a portion from him. And then only a few cities are mentioned right here when you go to verses 2, and then all the way through verse 9. Verse 9 says, Out of the portion of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon. Well, wow, that's pretty low, man. Yeah. For the part of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance with the inheritance of them. Meaning then, if Judah didn't have too much, where he could give stuff away, Simeon would have probably had nothing. <laughs> that's pretty big there. All right, we're going to also go to Judges chapter uh, 17. Judges chapter 17. Judges chapter 17. Of another verse you want to write down is uh, Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. But Dr. Oakman writes that Simeon is passed over entirely in the blessing of Moses given in Deuteronomy 33. How about that? So Simeon has been truly cut down. We're going to go to Le Judges chapter 17, and then uh, we'll look at uh, verse 7. Judges chapter 17, and then we'll look at verse 7. Notice right here, And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city of Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah. And I go to, notice not live, sojourn where I may find a place. Notice right here that this particular Levite had no dwelling place or home. Why? Because Levites... What you're going to find out, they were scattered. They didn't really have a home. So even though the Jews, I mean, here are the Jews. They live in Canaan. They're no longer sojourners. They're conquerors, and they live there during the time of Judges. But the Levites are still sojourning. How about that? The Lord really cuts them down. Uh, look at chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 1. Chapter 19. We'll look at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite, what? Sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. So you'll notice right here that at verse 1, this other Levite also was sojourning. Why? It goes to show that there weren't a lot of, Le uh, that there were Levites who weren't able to live in their own property or in their own land successfully. They had to sojourn. They had to share lands uh, from other tribes, from their own kinsmen. So in verse 2, the wife couldn't take that kind of a living. <laughs> so she had to run away. Probably didn't like the life of evangelism on the road. I want a home. <laughs> so she went back to her father's home. You Levites don't have your own home. I have to wander. <laughs> anyway, uh, another interesting thing for some of you who don't know, is if you look at uh, the inheritance of the Levites, do you recall uh, what the Levites have concerning property-wise? Ah, see that? None. Why? Because they're part of the priesthood. That was the excuse the Lord mentioned. But, in, uh, but when we go back to Genesis 49, we can see right here, Jacob's prophecy was fulfilled. They didn't really get the inheritance. All right, let's look at Genesis 49 again. Genesis chapter 49 again. And now we're going to look at Judah. There's a lot of interesting things concerning Judah. We see Simeon, Levi, separation from cruelty, dig down a wall. They have no inheritance. Uh, one note that I want to make is this. Concerning about uh, Genesis chapter 48 and the last verse, some people try to make that as a mention to uh, Jacob, where he conquered uh, Shechem, you know, and Hamor. But this uh, text should be proof right here that Jacob, wanted to, uh, Jacob had nothing to do with it. See that? So Jacob wouldn't boast about that at the last verse in Genesis, 
Genesis chapter 48 about killing Shechem and Hamor. That's more like boasting when you look at that verse. In chapter 49, he wants nothing to do, that, do with that. There is shame there. There's dishonor. So this verse should be proof against that interpretation from some commentators. All right, now we're going to look at, uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds, but I don't know if there's someone there at the tech table. So just let me know if I'm out of bounds. We're going to go to uh, Genesis chapter 49. And then we're going to look at Jacob's life here. Uh, not Jacob, excuse me, Judah. <laughs> Verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. So Jacob says that, Judah, you are going to be the one that your brothers will praise. They're going to look up to. Your hand will be in the neck of your enemies. So in other words, that's like a conqueror, right? So he's able to control, uh, uh, imprison the enemies. That's the idea. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. So Jacob says that, uh, your father's children, so basically your brothers, are going to bow down before you. They're going to reverence you. They're going to look up to you. You're going to, basically you can see right here, he's, that, he's the one that gets the firstborn inheritance, pretty much. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Uh, the meaning right here is this. So a lion's whelp, is referring to a lion's cub. That's the idea. So Judah is a cub, all right, a baby lion. And then the next part is talking about when he sees that prey, my son, you are going after that prey. And then you, uh, if you see those lions, what they do is that they stoop down. And then the couch is referring to that. It's that stooping down. That's the idea. Ready to attack the prey. That's what couch means. So, for that prey, he's stooping down. He's couching like a lion, like a grown adult lion. He's going to attack the prey. So the meaning is this. Judah is currently maybe a, a baby lion, but he's going to grow up to become very powerful. That's the idea. When he attacks the enemies, when he attacks the prey, it's just going to be like a grown adult. That's the figure of speech meaning there. <clears throat> So then who shall rouse him up? Who's going to basically get him angry? Who's going to stir him up? No one's going to dare do that. Uh, we've seen that with David's case, for example, right? A lot of people feared Judah's lineage, and we see one example through David. A lot of the Philistines were scared of David. They said, wasn't this the man that they said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands? So who's going to rouse him up? As a matter of fact, we know that it was through David's line. It is through David himself he was able to fully conquer the land of Israel and get out all those uh, pagan tribes, those other uh, unsaved tribes. And so Israel finally had a stabilized kingdom through David, through his conquest as a lion. And then that's why Solomon was able to have the richest reign ever in Israel's history because of David's conquest. All right, understanding that, we look at verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Okay, there's a lot of meaning right here. Okay? Before I... Uh, yeah, let me explain verse 10, and then I'll get to verse 11. So verse 10, the scepter. So we can see right here, it's like, uh, you know, the... Literally, as it says, the kingly line, the scepter, what the king holds in his hand. It's not uh, where he is designated as king. Usually when the scepter is upon a certain person, they receive that royalty or they get that exaltation. So that kingly exaltation, basically what Jacob's saying, will never leave Judah. The same thing as giving out of laws. So nor a lawgiver. So the one who passes out laws will not uh, depart from Judah's lineage as well. That's the meaning of nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Because it's between uh, the feet of Judah that his, seed is, uh, that his seed comes and then his lineage is all grown and born. 
So basically, his seed, his people, they will always have the lawgivers. They will always be the ones that have the power to pass out laws and the power to have uh, the kingly lineage. They will always have that until Shiloh come. Notice Shiloh is uh, capitalized right here. That's referring to peace there. It's referring to peace. So Jesus Christ, obviously, is the king of peace. And when he, comes, uh, when he comes down, Judah will be able to maintain or keep that kingly and law-giving lineage. And then when Jesus Christ comes down, then he'll finally take that for himself. And he comes from Judah's line as well. So in reality, Judah will always maintain that for eternity. That's the meaning there. That's quite a blessing Judah gets. Now, you notice what happens when you go after the world. You know what you've given up. Do you know how many Christians at the judgment seat of Christ are Reuben, and they see other Christians who are Judah take away their blessing at the judgment seat of Christ? So what's your eternal record, right? Not worth it. Don't, don't be Reuben. The last part of verse 10 says, when Shiloh comes, or Jesus Christ himself comes down with peace, then the people will be gathered together. Everyone's going to gather together to him. So the people, we can see several cases right here about the people who are gathered to Jesus Christ. They refer to, obviously, we can guess, the nation of Israel, where they are restored as a nation. Their Messiah has come down, and they are regathered. The second group is referring to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, they all have to go to him uh, to uh, give homage to him. And then another one uh, we see here can refer to the church. Because of Jesus Christ, a church exists. Remember, a church means called out assembly. So they're gathered. See, it's a gathering. And then also we see the crucifixion. So there are four cases here, all right? There are four cases here. So, the crucif so let me write them again, all right? Crucifixion. Uh, we won't turn to those verses for time's sake, so I'll just give you the verses, okay? Dr. Upman uh, has them out as follows. He has them out as John chapter 12, verse 32. John 12, 32. You want to write these things down. Again, they are John 12, 32. Number two is the church, and that is Acts 15, 14. Acts 15, 14. Oh, excuse me. The third one is referring to the restoration of Israel. The restoration of Israel. And the verses are Ezekiel 40 through 48. Ezekiel 40 to 48. And then Romans eleven twenty four through 28. Romans eleven twenty four through 28. And then number four would be referring to the nations, so the Gentiles. The Gentiles. They all come to bow down to the king. That is uh, Acts uh, 15, 17. Acts 15, 17. Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 11, verse 1 through 11, and then Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, verses 1 through 5. Amen. All right, now, uh, the British Israelites, how many of you have heard of them, all right? Everybody wants to be a Jew. You get black Hebrew Israelites, British Israelites. I mean, everybody wants to be a Jew. I don't know why, you know, so. <laughs> She's a literal Jew, though, so. But, but the thing is right here that British Israelites, in order to help out God, and this is their proof text, is Genesis 49 right here. Because the idea is, remember, Judah lost its kingdom, right? Israel lost its kingdom during the Babylonian captivity. So then, the verse says that the kingly uh, power will not leave Judah until Jesus comes, right? So then, how are we going to maintain that line? So then, supposedly, Jeremiah picked up Jacob's stone 
and then went on a trip and then married the Egyptian woman, went all the way to England, and supposedly your current British kings today, they're sitting on a throne that consists of Jacob's stone or somewhere in their palace. It goes somewhere along that effect. I may not be interpreting that accurately, but it's pretty much close. Basically, the idea is the, the Jewish kingly lineage is continuing on in England. Baloney, all right? That is so not true. That is so not true. Uh, what, one thing you know about Masons and uh, people who get into elitist, occultic stuff, they always try to take some kind of Jewish uh, claim for themselves. Uh, but then they're lying through their teeth. Quite often you're going to see that. If we look at uh, Genesis chapter uh, 49, the idea is this. The, the flaw with that argument is that if Judah receives that scepter, then from Genesis 49 all the way to Saul's timeline, there was no king in Judah. As a matter of fact, Benjamin was the king uh, through Saul. So then, uh, what's going on right here? See, the, so there's a fault in their argument. The idea is this. This is the simple answer to this. The kingly lineage will always be Judah's. That's simple, all right? So it's not going to go to British Israelites, black Hebrew Israelites. It's not going to go to the Gentile nations. It's not going to go to Simeon or the other tribes of Israel. That kingly lineage and that law-giving power will always belong to Judah. That's the idea. It's that simple. It's not saying that there's no gaps in there. Of course there can be gaps. But the, idea is this, but the idea is it will never leave him. It will always remain with him. And especially since Jesus Christ comes down, he's going to uh, take that for himself. A lot of people might claim to be a Jew, uh, a Jew or a king or Jesus Christ is on them. And there have been people who claim to be the Messiah. But God says, no, it's never going to them. It, it will always go through Judah. All right, now, uh, oh, the fun part was verse 11. Okay, so I cannot cover verse 11, but that was going to be the fun part. So we'll, we'll cover this one next time. We'll have to cover this one next time, but verse 11 was the fun part. I do want to make uh, one mention before I forget. At chapter 48, uh, I made a mistake, actually, so it's important that I mention that. Uh, there are some people who, would, uh, who brought up my mistake, and actually, I'm glad that they did. That way, I can make sure that I don't teach anything incorrect. So, I mentioned at Genesis, uh, not 48, 47. At Genesis 47, I mentioned that uh, there was no record about Joseph uh, buying the people, but actually, he did, actually. There was, it was just very subtle, the wording, though, that I couldn't really uh, see that. It was at, uh, yeah, verse 23... Uh, then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. So I took it as I have bought you this day your land for Pharaoh. That's how I took it as actually before. So that, that, that one word and, uh, because I didn't really catch that one, that one threw me off. So then uh, Joseph, he bought the people and also the land for Pharaoh. So we see right here that these people, that they were bought by Pharaoh, but it still didn't change the fact when uh, some people would like to use this as a communist passage, that the funny thing right here is that when you uh, look at the people's response, one is that at verse 25, these people, they wanted to, from their free choice, their free will again, voluntary service, want to offer their services uh, to Joseph, to the government. You don't see that nowadays. <laughs> you don't see that nowadays. Uh, they weren't forced to do so by communists, right? Communists, they forced the people to servitude. But uh, this one was a capitalist exchange, you see that? So it was something that was bought. So that's number two, voluntary. Two, it was a, still a capitalist uh, setup, not a communist setup. Third thing is that compared to the average American being taxed nowadays, <laughs> they still receive better tax wages for a slave, for a servant, all right? So it still didn't change that fact. It's not really a communist passage. Okay, uh, let's have our break. Father God, I pray that uh, you'll bless the break time, our fellowship, and everything that we say and do, may it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, break. Please make sure that you say...